Did you kill much when you were alive? Very little. Welcome to The Short Game, a podcast about fitting video games into your daily life. I'm Laura Nash, and I'm with Reagan Kelly. Howdy there. And Nate Heininger. How you doing, Laura? I'm doing great, other than my multiple takes on the intro. <laughs> yes, but we'll have edited all of those out. Our listeners need never know. Never yep. know. It's a secret. I'll take it to my grave. We're here today to talk about Grim Fandango Remastered. Uh, it's for the PS4 and Vita, Mac, Windows, Linux. You can get the whole thing for 15 bucks, and it takes about 10 hours total. If you're good at it. <laughs> if you're good and you use hints yes. liberally, which we'll talk about. We're going to get into it, but this game uh, could take you upwards of never finishing. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is like the ultimate game for scalable difficulty, only it, it's not a game mechanic that scales the difficulty. It's how much do you feel like consulting walkthroughs and hints. It's really like a cheater tolerance. And we're going to talk about what it's like to play this game in 2015 today. Um but yeah, it's really, you can make this game as easy or as difficult as you want. And I think no matter how you choose to play it, you're going to have a lot of fun. Yeah, there's enough humor that even if you're a dirty, dirty cheat, you'll get through this game just fine and have a lot of fun. As the dirtiest of cheaters, I uh, I enjoyed the hell out of this game, even though I really did rely heavily on walkthroughs. Uh, but let's talk about like why we did this game. I mean, what this game's like... 20 years old, right? Like what brought I know this and up? I've wanted I've wanted to play this game since I heard about it and it was virtually impossible to play until this remastered edition came out. Oh yeah. I mean, this game came out in 1998. I didn't have a Windows PC in 1998 and this was exclusive to Windows PCs at the time and for many years afterwards. And um I mean, there was no Mac port. I was a Mac nerd at the time and that meant that I was really restricted in what Okay, I'm still the biggest Mac nerd, but I, I, gaming wise, like I didn't have any options then. I, I don't know if I even knew about Grim Fandango at the time. I did have a PC, a uh, Windows based PC, and I played a lot of video games at that time. I still didn't know that Grim Fandango existed. I, I was stuck on um, games like Doom and Heretic and whatever I could get through, like Prodigy's fun little game tab <laughs> that would give me you know, pre pre E bombs world and all those games, but basically what little flash basic games I could get. I had no idea. Uh, also failing miserably at mist over and over and over and over, but basically generally not understanding what mist was a comp was going for. Um, I didn't even know Grim Fandango existed. I mean, I had a PC and that was virtually all the gaming I was getting because my parents for some reason thought that computer games were naturally educational. And still we didn't seem to do this. I was also in that mist sim type of game yeah. world but uh number munchers did a lot for that uh oh, number yeah. munchers did a lot for the parents opinion of computers thank you number munchers yeah 98 <laughs> was the same year as ocarina of time half-life starcraft baldur's gate thief metal gear solid just giant games 1998 was an amazing year for games like amazing and i was stuck on my little macintosh playing um like escape velocity at the time. Like yeah. I, I didn't have any of these options then. Um, we do feel bad for you. Yeah. I, I didn't really get this stuff until much later, but holy crap, 1998, like Ocarina of time reinvented video games. Starcraft basically invented a new genre or at least popularized some ideas that had existed in other, in other games, but really like met a turning point, like half life reinvented narrative games um thief like wow like invented the stealth game genre like this was an incredible year for games and grim fandango the game we're talking about today is called the pinnacle and end of adventure gaming it's both the you know kind of holy grail of what's possible in the genre and the thing that killed it yeah so sad that this like so for those of you who aren't super familiar with his work. Um, Tim Schafer, who is super important in gaming, even today with, you know, he's still releasing amazing games with his studio, um, Double Fine. But at the time, Tim Schafer, who 
was the creative director on this game, uh, was working with LucasArts. And LucasArts had been on a real streak of amazing games. They had done the uh, Maniac Mansion and Day of the Tentacle games. They'd done the Monkey Island games. Uh, A lot of games that were absolutely huge commercial successes, sold zillions of copies, also huge critical successes. Everybody loved those games. Um, And I think at the time it was because at the time, with the limitations of computers being what they were, uh, the only way to tell really rich, interesting stories and also have things like humor in your video game was to do an adventure game. It was really the only genre that was doing that. You know, the alternative were things like Number Muncher. Um, But we were, in 1998, starting to see this explosion of other genres of games that were also telling stories. So... LucasArts was trying to figure out how to make a game that would still be a modern, interesting looking, you know, a a big seller. They wanted a game that would be a blockbuster like Monkey Island, uh, but they also wanted to continue this heritage of adventure games and adventure games had been selling more and more poorly. You know, the game that that Tim Schafer did before this was Full Throttle, which is another awesome game. Um, but it was 2D in an era when people were starting to look for 3D games and it didn't sell particularly well. And um, they were really hoping for this to turn it around. Three-dimensional. And along comes the 3D adventure game from LucasArts. Three million bucks invested. Unfortunately, it did not pay off. It did critically. People loved the game. It won a bunch of awards, but did not sell at all. Probably because it was so damn hard. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, you've played Mon- if you've played Monkey Island, that was pretty hard. But yeah. I think adventure games get harder once they're in 3D space because it's harder, you know, to see things, you know. Yeah, I know. I keep harping on it. And this game is a product of its time. It, it's just the way adventure games have matured. I didn't play a lot of them during this time. I've mostly played modern adventure games. This does not have any of the conveniences that a modern adventure game has. And so you are very much up to your own to resolve these puzzles is one word for them, but I think it's like building blocks of moving the story forward and that you had to have happened to have talked to the right person at, at the right time and noticed the right thing in that conversation yeah. that you had. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It, it's uh, It really shows its age in this way, and yet it still feels like an amazing, fresh game because of the humor, the writing, the voice acting. Uh, it's a game that tells a story better than almost any other game that I've ever played. But it does still kind of feel clunky. I'm really, really glad that they remastered it though. Uh, Until this remaster came out, it was really hard to play this game on modern computers. I had looked into it a while back. Uh, There's a a VM, like all the previous Mm -hmm. LucasArts games would run under, uh, ran on the Scum engine. And there was a great uh, sort of emulator kind of thing called Scum VM that would run those Scum games almost flawlessly on practically anything. But Grim Fandango runs on something called the Grime Engine, which is actually kind of a combination of things, but the 3D runs under a kind of a modified version of the, um, oh, what's that Star Wars game that LucasArts did around that same time? Uh, Knights of the Old Republic? Knights of the Old no, Republic. it was yeah, way before do. that. Um, oh, I was like... Uh, like, I don't, I don't remember. Know. It was, any, in, in any case, it was a, uh, it was a 3D but game. But then later, you'll yeah. never know. It was a 3D Star Wars game. They they appropriated the Star Wars game engine to do the 3D, and they have two-dimensional backdrops that are like sort of pre-rendered 3D scenes. So the the environment of the game is all pre-rendered. It's just two, you know, three-dimensional, kind of like mist. Everything was three re- pre-rendered in advance, except the the characters are these 3D models. They look kind of angular like an N64 type character. Um, and in, in any case, it was really hard to get this to run. On modern computers, there was a project called like Revive VM or something like that. I'll, I'll look it up and I'll have a link in the show notes. If you still happen to have a copy of this game lying around in its original form, you can run it using this VM thing now, but it's pretty hard. So having this reissue of it was amazing. You don't have to screw around with these terrible like compromises. You can play a game that's been 
redone slightly, but still really true to its original form. It's basically the original game with some new lighting effects, and they haven't really altered it in any noticeable way. So Justin, my boyfriend, has a copy that we found when he cleaned out his bedroom. Ooh, I'm um, jealous. From high school. Well, we can't play it, but I do have a co physical copy that I could stare at while I was playing this. And restoring the game, um, there's a fascinating article we'll include in the show notes that talks about um, how they not only had to find original drives with assets by tracking down former employees of LucasArts, since LucasArts closed right after this launched, but they also had to then, once they had the drives, find something that would be able to get the information off of the drives. They had to find old computers. They had to find old servers. They had to basically rebuild a 1998 infrastructure in order to get the assets they needed to complete the game. And occasionally you see this. There's parts where the assets kind of suck. The cutscenes yeah. won't look great. That's when they didn't have really high fidelity uh, original models to pull from. Um, and there's a lot we have actually, you know, written down as getting through the game in 2015 is a different beast. Uh, Justin was telling me stories about going online and, you know, the fledgling hint system, internet forum system of playing this in 1998. Things are very well documented now, but I for one don't have the patience that I might have back in the day. I just oh, need yeah. to get through the puzzles and get to the good stuff. Yeah. So this this show is about fitting games into your life. If you want to play this the truly hardcore no walkthroughs way, this game won't fit into your life. It will not. You have to use a walkthrough. And I think even if you go back to 1998, people probably did use a walkthrough. I mean, oh, if you if you look at the credits online about it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the credits of the game, there is a credit for somebody who managed their hint call in line like this is a, a game that they expected you to get stuck they expected you to go on CompuServe or whatever and find a news group where somebody would explain the puzzles to you and if that failed they had a call in line where you could call up LucasArts and ask them to give you a hint I mean this is a this is an expected part of this experience and it's just not something that modern gamers expect so you have to go into this game with an idea of okay how stuck do i have to be before i turn to a walkthrough or some other type of hint system and what is going to be my hint system of choice how am i going to get through this game given the differing expectations of a modern gamer and what did you use nate i actually found a um just a straight up it was it was a walkthrough that still said enter this room and get through the dialogue and solve the door puzzle or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it at least told me kind of where to go, like in what was important in each room, but not necessarily the specific elements and how to do it precisely. Sometimes I had to, when I got really stuck, uh, even though it was telling me what to do, I still, you know, I was trying to get through this in order to, enjoy the story mm -hmm. so um which i think is the best part or at least the characters in the world that they created so i honestly didn't care too much about my integrity of puzzle solving you know i know that i'm not great at point and click adventure games let alone ones from 1998 so i just used it pretty uh pretty much all the time i would try to solve it immediately on my own and as soon as it became like nope this isn't readily apparent i would at least look for some sort of guidance. Would you recommend uh, so, the walkthrough that you use? Yes, but if you're asking me which one, hold on, give me just a second. Uh, it actually came from Eurogamer.net. Oh, I love Eurogamer. Would, They're great. Yeah, which would, um, you know, it, it basically said it in paragraph form. Um, I did eventually from time to time look at some videos to just see kind of what I was supposed to be looking at because, again, I would have a hard time identifying because it's it's the walkthrough that I used was pur purposefully vague enough that I at least had to, you know, make my own assumptions. But yeah, that's it, the it, best way with something like this. You want hints, not walkthroughs. Well, like this is probably more on the walkthrough than hints, but still at least not exactly like this is what you do. Click this, click this, click this, click this, you yeah. know. Mm -hmm. And you played it on your uh, on your computer? I did play it on my computer. I purchased it through Steam. Did it play uh did it play with like keyboard and mouse or with I played it on the PlayStation 4, so I, I wonder how the the Steam version works. Oh, I did computer as well. It's 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 a point and click. You mostly use mouse. Occasionally there's keyboard. Yeah. But 
the only thing I'll say is for people who play it on on computer is I didn't know until uh, I think I complained in our group chat about how slow Manny moves. Uh, I didn't know you could run until maybe an hour into the game, and he walks really, really slowly. And so if you hold shift, uh, <laughs> he will run. On, I, I had the exact same problem. On the PS4, it's one of the shoulder buttons. I forget which, but there's a shoulder button you hold to run. And frankly, there's no reason not to be running 100% of the time. It really speeds up just getting from place to place in the game. Even if you're running at full speed, you're going to be going a long time between places. And that's one of the most annoying things about this game to a modern audience is the pace, because you'll know exactly where you need to go to get X item, and you're still going to have to run through a lot of long hallways. It could be worse, but uh, yeah, worse, I totally but agree. <laughs> yeah. You have to see them crawl up the ladder every time. Yep. <laughs> up and down those ladders. Up and down those ladders. Yep. <laughs> I definitely went into this expecting to get stuck. I've played other games in this sort of milieu, and I knew I would need a good walkthrough, but I knew that I wanted something that would be um, n more giving me hints rather than uh, like a straight up walkthrough with step-by-step -step directions. I wanted to be you know, encouraged to find the solution for myself. So the first thing I Googled was uh, Grim Fandango hints, and I found something that I definitely recommend as a companion to this game. It's uh, the Universal Hint System uh, guide to this game. They actually have like a product that they want to sell, which the website is so retro and it's got a lot of really ugly ads on it. But um, like they actually want to sell you their like Palm Pilot app. It's a pretty dated website with all of these. Uh, <laughs> Where you can download and have them all in your Palm Pilot and searchable. I know. But actually, fortunately enough, they have a great mobile site. And, uh, Let's take a minute to talk about Palm Pilots. You guys remember Palm Pilots? Yes, indeed. I had a Palm Pilot. I was really I enthusiastic. Of, oh my God, we're so old. I did not have a Palm Pilot. Are we going to die soon? Yes. Yes. But fortunately, Manny will be there to... Uh... No, Manny won't because, well, spoiler at the end of the game, yeah, it's a happy well, ending. Mm. So long story short, if you don't have a Palm Pilot, you can use the Universal Hint system on your smartphone. They have a really nice mobile site that strips away most of the crap. And uh, what's really great about this is that you um, uh, it lists their hints in I think in our in, uh, I think in our interactive fiction episode we kind of talked about Invisi clues. This is kind of like that. Uh, it, it tells you you know you click on a question that says how do I find a gun and it'll say have, you know, the, a question to you, like, have you thought about looking for it in the sewer or something like, and then you, you tap again, and it'll give you a slightly more directed, uh, directed instruction, like go down to the sewer and look around underneath things, you know, like you might have 12 or 15 different hints for any particular question. And it's up to you how many of these hints to look at. Yeah, sometimes that's it'll even awesome. give you the first step that's kind of a red herring. It'll give you a hint towards something that won't work, but will trigger you to get the answer that will work. It's really nice about giving you those in-between hints when you need it. Yeah, so I 100% recommend the universal hint system, and I'll have a link in the show notes. I would recommend just bookmarking it on your phone and, and glancing at it as you play, because that's how I did it, and I thought it was really great. I kind of wish they'd built something like that into the game as a part of the remaster. Yeah, I think that would be a perfect um, compromise because I, I, I'm interested as to why they decided to remaster this game. Like I know it's, I know that it's uh, wildly, I don't know. It's almost got a cult following to this point, but uh, have you guys looked at the sales numbers or anything? Cause this was recently released. Yeah, it's, it's doing pretty well. I know they decided to re-release it because it was completely inaccessible. And yeah. the other reason they wanted to do it and um, is because they, wanted to have an archive because it's actually going in, you know, it's up for places like MoMA and um, Smithsonian as like a video games as art. Like this is one yeah. of those games that is held up as a pinnacle. And they realized that if they didn't archive it soon, they were going to lose the game 
for good. It was going to disappear. So it was both a commercial look and an archival uh, mission. Um, yeah, that's interesting. There's a couple different companies I've heard that are out there that their entire, I don't know if company's right, the right word, but maybe organization, that their entire goal right now is video game archival as these systems become obsolete and you know, people might hold on to an Atari because it's cool, but they're probably not holding on to a tower that they built in 1993. And so people are going around and trying to make sure that these games are still at least around or available or to some degree playable or else they'll just be gone, which is a weird thing to think about for video games because it's still a relatively new, you know, form, a new media. I mean, the same thing happened with film, though. I mean, they lost a ton of films before 1940 because the yeah. film was flammable. And if well, you kept what it I around, mean. it would start a fire. <laughs> like, and that's what I mean, though. It's interesting that, like, you know, for us, film's been around forever. It's been around for a long time. It's just, it's ubiquitous. It exists. Uh, it's interesting for video games to be reaching that point to where they are gone for good. It is really interesting. I've actually gone a couple of times to events with this video games museum here in Mountain View, California. Um, and now I'm trying to remember the name of it because it has a name that's not just the video games museum. And I, I, I'm drawing a blank. I'll try and have a link in the show notes. But in any case, I've talked to some archivists and there's a lot to it. And it's not just about preserving the cartridges, the packaging that comes with them, the machines themselves. Um, it's also about trying to get all of the ephemera that comes along with a game and preserving just not just the game itself, but the sort of culture and materials surrounding the game and, and kind of archiving that in a way that you know, future uh, academics will be able to look at. If they're going to be archiving a game like this, they would be archiving the print materials that came in the box. They'd be archiving the ads for the game. They'd be talking to the developers and trying to get as many of their thoughts as they could. So it's really important that we sort of preserve that culture now before these products uh, and and other information and stuff is lost and also before these developers all forget everything and die like it's important yeah and there's a couple of things that we've mentioned are gripes some of these modern you know things we want from this game that can't exist because of the way the game was set up um the engine is so cumbersome that adding things like a hint system which they put in monkey island because it was 2d it could afford the extra bandwidth this one, they couldn't do it. They can't auto-save. So save frequently because occasionally you'll pick up an object and you accidentally throw it partially off screen. You can't pick it up and you have to go back an hour. Huh. That's what happened to me. Oof. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes weird things happen. Manny, the lead character's head disappeared for about a minute and a half. He just walked <laughs> around with no head. Hey, it's the land of the I, dead. Things are weird. Yeah, it worked out. Weird things happen. The game. Yeah, I had a character like straight just spasm in the middle of his cutscene, talking to me, just like gyrating super hard the entire time that they were talking. Yeah, it's a really weird engine, but they've done a pretty darn good job with this remaster. And I feel like this is a version of the game that, because they've taken some care with it, people are going to be able to go back and play. You know. 100 years from now if it's maintained so like we've got a we've got a copy of the game now that's going to be able to be archived in a way that's going to work hopefully yeah it was actually interesting to see i had not put together that it was released the same year as ocarina of time because some of the character models actually reminded me of some ocarina of time characters and i thought they looked uh i thought they looked fine on modern computers i thought i was never other than the character spasming out and some some weird little things like that, I was never taken away from the story because I thought something didn't look good, you know? And the characters are probably the most exciting thing about the game. Um, Manny, our central character, is maybe the most charismatic uh, central character in a video game that I've ever played. Like, I loved Manny. And I, I think that all of the characters are beautifully voice acted and they are, like, this played like 
a Pixar movie. You know, like the the plot is interesting in every you know in every detail. The characters are all interesting and fully voiced, and there's never a moment where I groaned and thought the voice acting was bad or that the writing was in any way less than awesome. Um, you know, Manny's amazing. Where do they get these guys? They don't qualify for anything good, so I can't sell anything good. I can't work off my time, and I'm stuck. Stuck selling walking sticks to a bunch of burros for eternity. I need better clients. I need a real saint. I need a lead on a rich, dead saint. Uh, Meche, uh, or you know, uh, Mercedes, the the leading lady, is you know is charming and interesting. Are you sure you're Mercedes Colomar? Yes. Would you like to see my birthmark? Sure. Where is it? It's wherever you guys put my skin. Um, Gladys, the sort of sidekick, gigantic demon, hot rod driving, you know, orange fellow is funny. Gladys? Gladys? Is that a German name? Oh, no. My roots lie not in any earthly nation's soil. I am an elemental spirit summoned up from the land of the dead itself and given one purpose, one skill, one desire to drive or to change oil and adjust timing belts if no driving jobs are open. Kind of looks like a dude, a, um, the rock people from Ocarina of Time. Um, <laughs> good point. That was the one when I just said that was the that was my first thought with that guy. And this game is so stylish and it's this mix of noir and Mexican folklore and um, art deco. And it's got this really cool vibe where they pull on all of these references, mix them up together and just everybody is really cool. I don't play a lot of games where everyone is cool, but funny. Everybody's smoking. Everyone's smoking. (laughs) When do you see that? Um, well, this was 1998. It's okay in video games at that point. You have lots of dames. Mm-hmm. I like a game with dames. It's also heavily referential. If you've watched any noir films with Humphrey Bogart in them, Manny's kind of based off Humphrey Bogart. And my favorite reference, um, one that Justin uh, pointed out to me, is that there's a character that's basically Lauren Bacall in um, To Have and Have Not. She has a you know, cigarette, and she's leaning on the door, and she speaks beatneck poetry, and she's about two feet taller than Manny. It's <laughs> wonderful. That was great. Manny, at last we're alone. Tell me, how are the bourgeoisie? Fine. How's Max? Oh, Gramps, don't start. What are you doing with a snake like Nick? I'd lay it on you, Manny, but uh, I don't think you'd get it. Messing around with your boyfriend's lawyer is pretty dangerous. Oh, maybe I was wrong. You do get it. Yeah, they do a good job. Uh, I mean, there is almost every type of dialect you can think of. There, there are. It's very multinational uh, cast for this. There's a lot of game. Spanglish. Like Manny there is. Uh, throws a lot of Spanish words in. But the way native Spanish speakers do. Yeah. Not like guacamole. Yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what I wanted to say is that, so we just did a game that was very heavily influenced by Day of the Dead, Land of the Dead, all of that. This is not guacamole. No. Guacamole is like a... I don't know, an American's understanding of Mexican culture <laughs> done to a, done on a joke level. Yeah, guacamole is appropriation in many ways, mm-hmm. and this game is just seeped in it. It's, it's Mexican influence like it's noir influence. Yeah, it feels yeah. effortlessly cool, and it also feels like this effortless, perfect merging of these things that you would never expect to see together. The, the Aztec folklore, the Mexican Day of the Dead visual Im- imagery, the 1930s, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, Art Deco? Art, Art Deco visual style to all of the architecture and, and technology in the Land of the Dead. It's, it's just an effortless blending. It feels like it was meant to be together. And yet, it's so strange that these things are combined. You learn so much about the world without anyone ever sitting down and being like, 
hey, this is how everything works. Like through the dialogue between Manny and his boss and his receptionist, really early on, you get a full understanding of kind of where they are and what this world, how the world works and where they are and what happens to people after they die. And it's never just someone sits down and says, these are the things. It's just through conversation and through your exploration of the world. The intro premise is that Manny, Manny Calavera, is the travel agent for the dead. And so he has um, the workaday job. It sounds very glamorous to be um, the guy with the hood and the... Yeah, the Grim Reaper. The Grim Reaper, but the Grim Reaper is a day job. He's working off his student loans, basically. He's trying to get to the afterlife. And um, we're talking so much about the style and flair of this game, but it's also hilarious. It is hysterical. Yeah, it's sad and so funny. It's both high and low comedy. Like, there's all of these funny moments in it that are amazing, brilliant, insightful jokes. And there's also a lot of really funny kind of just bad jokes like a fat guy who can't fit through a door joke yeah and then a cultured joke about like ascending between multiple different levels of heaven So Manny is working off his debt to the powers that be by shepherding uh, lost souls from their lives, from the ends of their lives, into their journey through the land of the dead and into the ninth underworld, which is presumably heaven or the, you know, the final resting place of all souls. And um, he has to work off this debt before moving on himself. And so his gut, his job is to meet these recently deceased souls and sell them a travel package. And they can earn or pay for this travel package depending on how good they were in life. And the inciting uh, strangeness of the game is that it seems that these really great people, you know, he he, uh, he meets or actually kind of steals a client, uh, Meche or, or Mercedes, Uh, who was a saint, more or less, in life. A wonderful person. And yet all she qualifies is a four-year walk through the land of the dead. She doesn't qualify for uh, for the number nine train, which is a luxury train into the next world that takes only nine minutes instead of uh, four years. You know, a major part of this game is talking to people and the dialogue trees, where probably the majority of the dialogue actually doesn't accomplish the moving forward of a puzzle but rather fills out the world around it there might be one specific tree that you go down that actually does solve something or help move something forward but there will also be two to three other kind of dialogue trees that you go down to just learn more about the character and learn more about the world and i think we were talking about this before but i'm assuming you guys did as well you i would basically exhaust every single dialogue tree that i could and Meche was a really funny one because it's there's a moment where um, Manny, who cannot understand why she would not get a ticket on the number nine to him, this is an easy sale. That's actually kind of the main point of it is that she should be a luxury package. She's going to get a huge commission and it's going to be super easy because she was a total saint. And when she doesn't qualify, you go through this series of dialogue trying to grill her about the Like, well, did you ever cheat on your husband or did you ever kill any animals? And all of her. (laughs) Did you murder someone? Yeah. Not even a little. Yeah. yeah, Not even just hurt someone. And like her answers are always hilarious. And it's like, did you hurt any animals? And she's like, well, one time while volunteering at the animal shelter, I might have accidentally. He's like, ah, just move on. (laughs) And like none of that actually moves. Like you could, there is a way where you could you know, happen to have chosen the perfect tree. It's usually the bottom one or the second to bottom one that kind of will move it forward and get you out of the conversation. But you never miss out on anything by choosing the wrong thing in the dialogue tree. All you ever miss out on is more of the dialogue. You know, you want to, you want to really try every single option in these dialogues because they're all so hysterical. Yeah. And that's the game to me. Like these characters and the world that they created, that's what made this game and what makes it still hold up like we've been talking about the gameplay it's it the puzzles whatever eh it's not that great to our modern viewpoints but the 
story and these characters in the world and everything that they created is so funny and so kind of sad at the same time and rich and it's great. And I think the branching also ties into the failure when you're just doing the wrong thing to try to accomplish a the puzzle. They've written a lot of extra dialogue or extra you know, outcomes. If you try stupid things, just hoping to solve the puzzle magically, which sometimes works, honestly, um, then it'll usually have a joke. They'll throw in something. Um, there's a joke that I brought up. Uh, you can have show a bunch of pigeons a balloon animal of Robert Frost. Yeah, there you you can get a balloon animal of Robert Frost in this game, interestingly enough. Yeah, that's what we're working with here, people. That doesn't <laughs> solve a puzzle, although I tried it, but it gives you a really funny um, answer, and then it gives you a Steam achievement, so <laughs> hey. Which I missed, so I'm going to have to go back and do that one again. All the way back to year one. I don't yeah, I don't you know if you to. can go back and do that one. I, I, <laughs> there's not much going back in this game. The, the game is divided into four years, and this is a really great structure because, like, we've been taught, we just played Life is Strange, which was a, you know, is an episodic game where we played uh, The Walking Dead. Uh, adventure games work really well if they're divided into episodes like this, and I don't know if this is the first time that I saw that, um, but this game is really clearly divided into a four-year journey of the soul, where this is, this is part of Aztec mythology, where, um, you know, Manny is really while he's trying to find Meche and, you know, save the woman that he maybe thinks he might kind of love, he's really on this four-year journey of the soul into the afterlife. And the first year is mostly you escaping the office that you work in. But the, you know, the second year, the third year, the fourth year, each of these is like a clearly defined chunk of the narrative. Each year... Um, we really just see Manny on the day of the dead of his first year in the afterlife, his second year in the afterlife, and so on. And um, it kind of makes it an episodic game. And it was a really great way of breaking it up. I, I thought that was fantastic. Yeah, my favorite thing about it being set on Day of the Dead is that it's a total scam, awesome cheat by the developers to not have to render crowds. <laughs> because in the first year, they're in the office and they go out and they're like, why is no one on the streets? Why are there no cars? Why is there no background animation? Because everyone's at a parade. Yeah, it's Day of the Dead. Everyone's off visiting their living relatives in the land of the living. Yeah, why is this awesome um, land in part two, which is... My favorite, Rubicava. Oh forever. my God, Ru Oh, um, Rubicava is so great. Go on. It's it's this amazing world um, that is it's, it's a casino. There's an underground um, kind of beatnik bar. There's a tattoo parlor. It's so cool. There's a dock full of sea bees. Literally bees. There's yeah, no one yeah. there except a bunch of beatniks and bees. There's nobody there because everyone is out. Because all the skeletons are off visiting their loved ones in the land of the living. Or they're watching Cats Race. Yeah, long story. Yeah, that was another... It's a nice little cycle of life and death of... Um, at the end of each year, Manny is downtrodden and in a very low spot. And then they say, year X. Cut to Manny at the top of his career path in whatever city he's ended up at. Oh my God, that was so... <laughs> so that was funny. like a great repeating joke. So at the end of year one, you've basically finally just escaped from El Mero, which is the central city of the land of the dead. We don't do we don't want a spoiler, right? Mm. Right. We're going to have uh, a spoiler break in a second. Were, yeah. So we'll uh, we'll leave that for later. But each uh, each end of each year is a great high point in the game. It's just a it's a it's a recurring joke that happens every time. And it's funny every time. I mean, the only thing that can keep Manny down is office politics. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> One of my favorite jokes, too, in the game is that, like, every time he's trying to get a new job, they're like, what kind of experience do you have? And he's like, sales. And they're like, <laughs> well, we've got a mop available for you. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. Like, yep, that's not a, that is a not very transferable skill. Sorry, <laughs> Nate. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Nate's in sales. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. That one was close to home. <laughs> well, before we get into the story bits and pieces, uh, we should probably talk a little bit about the design of this game. Yeah. Uh, 
huge difference from most of the adventure games that came before it and most of the adventure games after it. Like this was a really unique game in its design. Um, Probably the most weird thing about the game is that it doesn't have a HUD. It doesn't have any kind of on-screen controls. It's just you and the scene. You can click a button and you get to this inventory. It, it doesn't come up like a shelf or like something you can easily see everything in. It's it's Manny's coat pocket, and he could just reach in, grab an item, examine it, put it back. You know, you kind of have to scroll through items. It does a nice job of clearing them out from time to time. Yeah. Which is something that I appreciated because you don't just accrue things from four years of gameplay. Uh, usually if you have something and you haven't used it yet, you should use it. Except for the scythe, which is a pretty nifty little scythe. and <laughs> It's collapsible. It's a bolty tool. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, odds are if you encounter a puzzle and you don't know what to do, there's probably something to do with the scythe. You use your scythe a lot. If it needs to be cut or lifted or poked at a distance. Yeah, <laughs> anything like that, it's going to use the scythe. Mm -hmm. So there's no on-screen controls for you know walking or for inventory management. There's also no on-screen visible things to tell you what objects in the scene are interactable. But Manny actually looks at things. So Manny's head is on a little swivel. You know, he's looking around the scene. And as you're walking Manny around each scene of the game, he will look at certain objects. And that's your clue that that's an object that is interactable. I thought that was really subtle and yet totally worked. I, I could always tell what objects in the scene were interactable without it putting a big crosshatch on them or making them glow or making them stand out from the scene in some other way. They were really obvious because Manny looked at them. And you can also, on a computer, when you move your mouse around, um, things will become, you know, clickable, and you'll be able to see how you can interact with them, which which also really helps. I was playing on the um, on the PlayStation Four version, which I think was a really good port, and it plays great on a controller. Um, in the remastered version, they fixed the one big complaint most people have about the very first version, which is that the first version used what's often called tank controls. Basically, if you held forward, Manny was going to walk forward no matter which direction he was walking. So if Manny was facing the camera, the up arrow on your keyboard would send Manny walking towards the screen. Um, but if he was facing to the right, that would send him to the right and so on. Kind of like Resident Evil style controls. Yes, yeah, so you can actually choose to use that and you get an achievement in Steam if you play the game all the way through because Tim Schafer says that's how the game was designed. <laughs> yeah. Don't play it like that. Yeah, it actually says like because Tim told because Tim wanted this achievement or something like that. It makes yeah. an acknowledgement that it was an absurd goal to play the whole way through like that. Yeah, but in the new version, it's much more natural. It uses the style of gameplay that you're probably more familiar with, where the direction that you hold on your joystick or, or gamepad is relative to the camera. So if you hold right, Manny is going to walk towards the right half of the screen and so on. Um, works pretty well. Yeah, and unlike Life is Strange and a lot of modern games where you control uh, an individual character, the the game has fixed camera angles. If you walk into an area, the game will shift to the angle that that area is allotted. Yeah. They actually do a really good job with these, too. There's some very... Um, definitely, they took some time to decide what angle that you see the world in. And there are some that are purely on a cinematic level. Mm -hmm. Like, there's a, there's a bridge that you cross that has a floating airship uh, above it. And they could have had it right behind Manny or they could have had it, you know, from the top down like a lot of it is. But instead they chose an angle that's kind of as if you were down on the ground looking up at the bridge. So you see just a little bit of Manny, you see the bridge, and then you see the entirety of the airship. And it was very pretty and it was great because there's really not much to interact with there. You're just moving from one side of the bridge to the other. And they actually took the time to make it look nice. Yeah, great cinematic camera angles. Yeah, there are a few shots that are ripped directly from Maltese Falcon or Casablanca. And it's wonderful if you've seen mm. those movies to see that free framing happen. It's been too long since I've seen most of those, but I did recognize some of the characters as reference from that, particularly the Peter Lorre character. Um, yeah. Dang. Peter Lorre. Chow Chilla Charlie. Chow Chilla yeah. Charlie. <laughs> what else can you counterfeit? 
Nothing. Anything. So can you make passports? Manny, you still think like a living man in so many ways. No soul needs a passport. We are all citizens of the same nation, and our king rides a pale horse. So no passports? No. No, that little hologram is so tricky, you know? Hey, Reagan. <laughs> so great. Oh, my God. Um, all the characters in this are good. There's so many great voices, and some of them are really just not in it enough. My favorite voice in the game is Lupe, who I won't even attempt to do an imitation of. Maybe I'll be able to drop some clip of Lupe into the episode. Lupe is the coat check girl at your casino in Act 2, and she is the greatest character in the game. She spends some time explaining to you her coat check system for how she keeps track of the coats. Don't skip that dialogue. It's wonderful. Lupe is so great. Looks like Lupe's been in the sugar again. Evening, Lupe. Hi, Manny. I have to tell you about my new organizational system for the coats. Think she'll come in tonight? Manny, you ask me that every night. What am I supposed to say? You're supposed to say, yes, I think tonight's the night. Yes, I think tonight's the night. That you finally go nuts from waiting for the grand entrance of Ms. Mercedes Colomar. Let's try that again, shall we? Think she'll come in tonight? Yes, I think tonight's definitely the night. Thank you. It's my fault she's out in the woods alone, you know. <sighs> if you say so, Manny. Yeah, she's really funny and well, definitely worth... I, I didn't skip anyone's dialogue, even if I didn't particularly appreciate their voice. Uh, I just listened to everything. We mentioned the art styles and a nice hodgepodge. The score is too. It has orchestra and jazz and pan flutes over the end credits. And then there's also <laughs> these big band Duke Ellington things and mariachis. It's everything you want just put together into one big soundtrack. And it's glorious. Yeah, they've got the they've got the Mexican you know music and they've got the film noir soundtrack music. I found a there was one song, it's um when you're in the what is it the blue cadaver and that the whole blue area. coffin the blue coffin not cadaver yeah it um, was cadaver. nope coffin because they have those the blue coffin drinks that are like a little drinking like yeah. you drink That's out of a little coffin Oop, one second all right google okay. it. okay but i will uh continue talking the um <laughs> the song was almost pink panther <laughs> like it has a couple notes that are very similar with the pink panther seems theme song and that fits right in with it. It was great. I mean, you're kind of solving some mysteries as you're going along. The blue casket. Oh, oh. no one was right. Yeah. No I had one the was right. I had the first two letters right. <laughs> one of my favorite moments from the game came in the blue casket, when if you finally exhaust the dialogue options for one of the characters, she'll finally agree to read one of her poems at the sort of beatnik bar. And that's where we get the name of the game finally sort of explained as a part of a beatnik poem. Okay, okay last, last one, one folks. folks. With, With bony hands, hands I hold my partner. On soulless feet, feet we cross the floor. The music, the music stops, stops as if to answer. An empty knocking at the door. It seems his skin was sweet as mango when last I held him to my breast. But now we dance this grim fandango. And will for years before we rest. Yeah, and she'll actually just keep reading poems for you. Different and poems. Yeah, it's pretty she funny. Exhausts. My favorite one is when she just says, ashes to ashes to ashes to ashes to ashes to ashes. And she just says that to for me. like, <laughs> to me. Yeah. Ashes to ashes to ashes. <laughs> Uh, it's so wonderful. And yeah. I, I think my so my favorite I. poem, um, Little Easter Egg, is if um, Manny can take his turn at the mic, 
And if after that you ask her to recite a poem, she will repeat Manny's poem. He accuses her of plagiarism, and she says, no, it's a homage. <laughs> <laughs> well, they also do... Uh, you you first ask her to, so to read a you ask her to read a poem and she says what me get up there and pretend that this entire establishment is built as some sort of temple to me and she acts really offended and then as soon as you say no you should really go up to read she cuts you off with okay <laughs> it's like you should really go okay I'll do it it's and great. of course it's Oh, yeah. They're clacking their little bone hands together. <laughs> they make a lot of jokes about how they used to have skin all the time. <laughs> like, you could check my fingerprints if I still had skin. I bet you were beautiful when you still had skin. Over and over. This is something you did talk about was, this game's really morbid. I mean, it's about death. Oh, it's but dark. it's really morbid. Yeah. It talks a lot about death and souls and how we will continue relationships in the afterlife and how we move from one plane to another and who deserves a good afterlife and who is just kind of floating through the afterlife, not caring. It also gets into permadeath, basically. Yeah. Which I don't know if we want to talk about pre-spoiler. Well, but uh, let's just say permadeath. that the fact that these folks are dead doesn't mean that there's no stakes. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just say sprouting is the most terrifying thing that I have ever seen in a video game ever. I don't know why, but I just have this weird, it was like a visceral reaction to being sprouted. And I find it disgusting and terrifying. Yep. So It's beautiful and so scary. All right. Yeah. In fact, I think this is probably a good time for us to go ahead and take that spoiler break. We're getting a little short on time. We probably won't be going running down every moment of the plot, but here lies spoilers. So... Ladies and gentlemen, this is your spoiler break. Year two is Rubicaba. Rubicaba is the oh best. Oh my god, Rubicaba is the best. Okay, um, <laughs> year one is hard That's because you're still figure spoiler. you're still remembering how these kinds of games work. Um, but by the time we got to Rubicaba, the second year. Like I was on a roll and that's where it really doubles down on the this is a film noir. You know, we're suddenly in Casablanca. I mean, it might as well have been Casablanca. Such an exciting second act to this game. And and years two and years three and four were good, too. But this game is worth it based on year two alone. Well, the game just opens up so much more. Yeah. It, it, not that it was on a rail by any means in the first world. Like, you still have no direction, and there's a lot of running back and forth. But once you get to, to world or to year two, it is a much bigger game with many more characters and so much more life. Yeah, many more rooms, many more characters. And there's a lot of puzzles, and you can solve the puzzles, which each have multiple sort of pieces, in almost any order. So it feels a lot more organic, even while it kind of gets harder because you have to really look for things. Yeah, it stacks beautifully. You kind of start the world with giving a, a, a set of things that you're going to need. And from there on, it's kind of your, you know, the, the order which you figure them out will determine how you get those things. There is no set order that you have to acquire these things. And it's tricky. Mm -hmm. I, I was way more uh, using the walkthrough on this part than the year before. Yeah. And still enjoying it probably more. Because like I said, the story kept me going. The puzzles I felt were just something to get through to continue going through the game. I've written a chunk of pen and paper puzzles and adventure games. And the thing that fascinated me about this level is how layered it was. The puzzles stack so that you can't get too far in a single mission without accomplishing a piece of another. It's really beautifully layered. And it's hard to pull off in something is, that feels so sandbox. It, you really have to layer your achievements. You have to go to all locations. You have to go back and forth quite a bit to solve. It's hard. Yeah, let's let's talk through this a little bit because I think that this kind of illuminates why the game is so good and why the puzzle design, even while not feeling super modern, is at least really worthy of some praise. You know, when we're in Rubicava, our first thing that we discover is that you know, we were waiting for um, 
Meche to get here. We got we got to Rubicava ahead of her and almost a year ahead of her. And by the time that she arrives, uh, Manny has kind of taken over the town. He's gone from washing up in the automat to running the casino. And um, on the day that we pick back up in Manny's life, this is the day that he finally sees Meche again. She finally arrives in town and she arrives only to leave again on a boat. And hit you with a bottle. Champagne bottle. Yeah. At least she's classy. <laughs> At least she's classy. <laughs> no one has ever accused Meche of not being classy. She's the world's classiest skeleton. Yeah. Uh, she's very classy. Yeah. Our puzzles are basically about pursuing Meche. There's a boat leaving going the same way she was going tonight. And we have to get all the stuff. We have to get on that boat. So in order to get on the boat, we have to, first off, make a vacancy for ourselves by getting rid of one of the sailors. Yeah, it's a work boat. It's not a, a cruise or a, a passenger boat. It is purely a work boat. So there, you have to be a crew member to move forward. A union card. Mm -hmm. So in order to get on that boat, we need a union card. Uh, we need to uh, get rid of the person who would be taking that spot. We need to open up a spot for our buddy Glottis, who we can't possibly leave behind. We need to get Glottis some tools so that he can work a job on the boat. So he needs the uh, the tools to take care of the boat's engine, which is going to be his job on the boat. Say, what else do we need? I think that's that's the majority of it is that's two things for each. You need Gladys or you need Gladys to get tools and you need a union card and a spot for yourself. I was going to say there's also a hidden one, which is the problem is your friend Gladys, the hot rod enthusiast, has a gambling slash drinking problem and you have to get him on the boat Right. Yeah, and there's an entire other subplot of death and sadness and and um, <laughs> turtles uh, all the way down. Yeah, yeah, it's turtles all the way down. Adultery, well, not technically, but close. And there's so many layers even to these puzzles. I mean, it's not just a matter of I need a union card. Where can I find one? You have to go through a multi-tiered puzzle to get the elements to go through a multi-tiered puzzle to get the union card. I mean, it's a really layered, interesting whole puzzle structure um and this is a game where if you're not playing with a walkthrough or something like that you're really going to want to take notes did you guys play like um i don't know like the fallout games this is like Only a distant connection but you know how, yeah fallout 3 works you mm -hmm. know how like you might be working with like three or four different factions and you're kind of leading it all up to one point where it all kind of climaxes at that one point. It's one mission, one final mission, but it required you to work like three or four different factions up to that point. Mm -hmm. It's yep. kind of like that. But with where, no quest log. So with no, yeah, it's with all no in quest your log. Yeah, exactly. Where you're, you're, you're balancing a lot of different things, trying to advance them together so that everything kind of falls into place at the right time. And I think the reason that year two is the most fulfilling, not only because of the setting, which is great, but I think the games tier together so well because to get the pinnacle of each mission, you need to have at least taken the first few steps of the other missions. You can't complete one mission without starting the others. And I think that really helps the enjoyment of the game. You can't just pursue one path. We talked about Ocarina, which came out the same year. There's a lot of side quests that you can just complete on their own. This game, it's rare that you get a puzzle you can complete in isolation. And I think that really helps because you end up seeing more environments. You go back and forth. You talk to more people. You have to open up the world to do the puzzles in the first place. And I think that makes it much, much better. Mm -hmm. Something this game does absolutely masterfully that's, I think, a real challenge for puzzle and adventure games is that with an adventure game or a puzzle game, you have to have this structure where things start off very simple. You're just learning how puzzles work. And then they build, and you're opening up more and more and more possibility space, more and more options. And then at some point, obviously, you have to start solving these puzzles, and things start narrowing down, and the puzzles start getting easier. You know, you've already got the things that you need to accomplish your goals, and you're just putting them together in the right ways. And that gives you this sort of sense of acceleration in the story. Just like a good story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, in, an, in a puzzle game, the beginning, easy puzzles. The middle, hard puzzles. They're getting harder and harder. And then at some point, towards the end, 
puzzles are getting easier and easier, which gives you this feeling that things are happening faster in the plot. And each year has that structure in and of itself, but also the game as a whole has that structure. So act one is fairly easy and act four is actually fairly easy, but in the middle, Rubicava and the third act give you this feeling of real difficulty with really complex puzzles so that you have this feeling that the plot is accelerating. Things are moving towards a big culmination. It, it really makes it feel cinematic, even though, frankly, if you just stopped and let Manny stand there, nothing would happen. There's no clock on this smoke. game. Oh, that's true. <laughs> he does. Yeah, you have to not touch it for like 10 seconds and he starts smoking. Instantly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point. I hadn't really thought about it that way, the progression of it. I was, I was thinking of a swapper the whole time, though, that just got more and more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a puzzle platformer, not an adventure platformer. So Yeah, and I think that occasionally it does. There are a few puzzles that are unsatisfyingly easy, um, especially when you beat one of the minor big bads. Um, you can just click one button and take them out. It doesn't feel very satisfying, but there are times where you have a few steps to take out somebody or you have a few steps to put together a puzzle. They're not hard. They're not far from each other, but there's a couple steps. And I think that the biggest environment is Rubicabra year two. The second biggest is year three, which is this underwater world. And you go to a place called the edge of the world. Um, you have to fight a giant octopus, which is a big plus. Fight a giant octopus. Yes. Um, Finding the giant octopus is fairly easy. Mm -hmm. um, and getting to... <laughs> as it is in real life. As it is in real life. <laughs> and then year four, you actually get to backtrack through um, your previous places you visited. You go back to Rubicabra, you go back to El Moro. And so it feels like a homecoming. You're, you know, it's that one last mission. You got to go back to your favorite haunts. And it's really nice to get this kind of rehashing but it's easier you feel like you're an expert at the game at this point you know where everything is you know who all the characters are and you can breeze through the last few little things you have to solve across all the scenarios that you've seen throughout the game that was actually the last act of the game was almost as good as the second act of the game uh, i thought that the last act really did a great job of kind of letting you revisit those scenes of the the game it really had built up a lot of affection you know, really built up a, a big store of just like, wow, this whole thing was awesome. And it was great to be able to take that last few minutes in the last act of the game and literally get on a rocket sled and head back to the beginning of the game again and see how all of the different scenes that you had worked your way through had changed due to Manny's actions. A little bit of It's a Wonderful Life. Yeah. And <laughs> Nate, do you want to talk about the horror that is sprouting since you seem to have the most visceral reaction to it? I don't. I don't you don't? To, no. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why, but something about like it's just gross. So basically, you know, there is a there is a fear of death. You can't just run around this world and do whatever you want. Now that is to say, in the plot, there is a fear of death. This is a game that gives you zero failure states, the same as well that's as true. most other adventure yeah. games. There's no way to die and have to start over or have to reset. It threatens you with it at one point. Which point? Well, I, at one point you do get sprouted. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to get out of it. And it's fairly easy because what's in your inventory, there's two things and you use the one that's not your scythe. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah but, you'll, you'll yeah. survive the sprouting in that one instance. But yeah, like it does add dramatic tension. You're not all just dead. But what is sprouting? Yeah, it just shows that there's a deeper weight than just like, oh, now you have to walk for four years. You can just be dead, dead. And basically they have little guns that have a little flower on them. And I, I don't fully know like why it happens, but they shoot you with it and your entire body sprouts into flowers and leaves and you just grow from the inside out into a nice little garden but it is disgusting because you just become <laughs> weeds and flowers and they don't feel good while it's happening. The people are screaming. And presumably that means that you can't proceed into the ninth underworld. So right. you're screwed. Yeah, you're gone. And you still see the bones in the flower bed. Instead of soil, you see the bones of the person who sprouted. Mm. Yep. 
It's not pretty. It appears to be really the only way to die die. Like there is a time when you go into the morgue and everybody that's in the morgue in the land of the dead are people who have been sprouted. And it's terrible. <laughs> that mortician guys, he yeah. is nihilist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, that's he has a, a pretty dialogue. long he has a pretty long spiel about how every night he tells a different story, but it's every time it's a sad story because they all end in death. <laughs> it's pretty awful. I do want to say real quickly, though, that th- about sprouting, it's interesting that it is entirely a, I guess, if you will, man-made thing within the world. Like that, the only way you can die within the world, land of the dead, is if you get killed by another. It doesn't happen naturally. It's just these little guns. Mm-hmm. I don't really have much insight on that, but it is, you know, I think it's interesting. In year four, you meet a florist who has invented fast-acting. Sproutella. Sproutella. And, you know, it's very much a gang warfare type thing. There's a whole bunch of revolutionaries, and they don't sprout people, which is kind of awesome. Um, They do have pigeon skeleton birds. (laughs) Um, All this probably sounds really weird if you haven't played the game. Hopefully at this point you've probably gone and downloaded it. I mean, that's part of the fun of the game is you don't know what weird stuff is going to come next. Every single year... You didn't know what the next setting was going to be. You didn't know what the next puzzle was going to be. You didn't know if you were going to need a turkey baster or a drill or a... Metal detector or a tin can opener that came from a massive uh, kitty food box. You don't know if you'll be digging through a giant cat litter box. (laughs) Activating Um, a sprinkler. Yeah, poisoning a dude. Um Dealing with worker bees who literally yell, they control the means of production, which I thought was hilarious. (laughs) You literally have to inspire the bees to a uh, to a Marxist revolution. (laughs) Yeah, it's fantastic. Or will you bribe a lawyer? You never know what this game is going to be. And I think that's or will you blackmail a lawyer? (laughs) We're in a time when there are so many sandbox games and yet none of the games hold the possibility that this pretty you know, it's not linear, but it's very linear game inspires. Yeah. Yeah. It's not exactly 80 days because with 80 days, there's a million different ways that you can go and you won't get to see the other experiences. But with this one, there are so many different things that you can choose to read and choose to, uh, to explore that aren't necessarily necessary. Yeah. It's not going to give a different experience to each player or to each playthrough, but it is still full of surprises Everything about the story and the characters and the dialogue is surprising at every turn and delightful on every level. You know, the the dialogue is super charming and fun. The uh, the story takes really unexpected uh, mystery novel turns. It's just great. Um, and I 100% think that you should download this game now that it is available for just 15 bucks on so many platforms. You can play this game even if it's hard, like... Even if you read a walkthrough for every single moment of the game, even if you absolutely didn't think a moment about the solution to any puzzle, I think that this game is worth playing through just for its story, its characters, its voice acting, its humor. On every level, it's a delightful experience. In fact, if your only option is to watch a playthrough of this game on YouTube or something, do that. There's some really great ones. In fact, I looked up a couple while while I was preparing for this episode to revisit some of the my favorite scenes. And um, you can go and watch this game on YouTube if you don't want to play it. And there's some playthroughs that are only about four hours and hit all of the great highlights. Hit all the dialogue trees. Save the game often run as much as humanly possible (laughs) and use a hint system. You're going to love this game if you do those things. Yeah, I agree entirely. I more or less walked through my entire way and I had a great time. Totally worth it. Any final thoughts or favorite moments before we wrap up? Make sure you have Olivia recite all of those poems. They're all. Yeah, they are good. And now we dance the Grim Fandango. Grim Fandango. Something about lovers and mango. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm excited to hear the music uh, interspliced throughout this episode. It, it really is good. And you spend a lot of time with it because you are running around a lot. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game. Uh, you can find our show notes at www.theshortgame.net where you'll find links for everything we've mentioned in this episode. And some things that we haven't, one thing that I am really eager for folks to check out is there's an amazing video of Tim Schafer playing through this game. He hadn't played through it since its release in the 90s, and he played through it again recently um, on camera and commented on all of his favorite things about it. Uh, I think it's a two-parter and only the first part is up, but it's available uh, Uh, on YouTube, and I'll have a link to that in the show notes. You can also, of course, find a link on our website to our show on iTunes, where you can leave us a review. Uh, We really appreciate reviews on iTunes. They are probably the best way that you can support the show. Uh, So head to iTunes and look up our show or open the Apple Podcasts app and leave us a five-star glowing review full of all of your favorite things about me. I mean, the show. Shane's not here right now. He is actually in France, but everyone just picture Shane shaking his fist and being angry at you for not reviewing us just yet. Uh, Keep that in your head and go and write us a review. And of course, I've been your host, Reagan Kelly. You can find me on Twitter at Reagan K. That's R-A-Y-G-A-N-K. Laura, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Laura J. Nash. And Nate, how can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Nate STL. Thanks so much for joining us on this episode of The Short Game.